It's good to see all of you this morning and to worship with you on this beautiful Sabbath. Let me ask you a question. You guys, I need some responses here. Uh, have you ever inherited something from someone? Yeah, anybody inherited? Yeah. What have you inherited? A vehicle. Whoa, now there you go. That's awesome. I saw some other hands. Yeah. Okay, got some inheritance from mom when she passed. Michelle. Your grandpa's gun, yeah. Man, I tell you, my grandfather had a 22 rifle that he used on the farm, and I wanted it so bad, but my cousin got it. I still love her, though, so that's okay. Yes? Your sister's clothes, all right. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. <laughs> Not so sure about that, right? Yeah, go ahead. A genetic disease, all right. Yeah, that's, that's not always a good thing either, right? Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Grandma's books. Yeah, those are cool because you can go through and see their writing in them sometimes and, and uh, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, very cool. Very cool. You know, I, um, I uh, was really moved this past week when uh, they were doing a feature on uh, the, the babies of 9-11 who, whose parents had passed away and they had never seen their children, their, they'd never seen their fathers, most of them were fathers, uh, they'd never seen their fathers who, you know, were firemen and policemen and that had passed away. And they were doing a feature of these 20 year olds, uh, 20 year old uh, kids. Uh, and and they, I, I was just really moved because they would put a picture of the, uh, of the father on one side of the television screen and then they would put a picture of the child there. And I'm telling you, it was, it was really moving because you could see the father's eyes or you could see the father's smile or you could see the characteristics there of, uh, of this child mirrored in their, in their parent. You know, so we inherit those kinds of things as well. And, and uh, here are children who've never met their father um, but yet they inherited their eyes or their smile or, or, you know, some of them have this little dimple in the chin. And it was just, I mean, it was just like you could tell that they came from that gene pool, you know. I mean, it was just really, really cool. Um, and, and we all have those kind of things. You know, that's the thing. I, I saw, um, I did an interview of a, of a pastor this week via Zoom. And uh, during, the, during the interview, his little two-year-old kid came marching into the room and crawled up on his dad's lap, you know, and the dad's like, I'm sorry. I'm like, oh, no, it's okay. It's all cool, you know, but the minute I saw that child, I'm like, I said to the, I said to the pastor, I said, man, he has got your face all over. She goes, yeah, my mom is very disappointed. His wife, his, his wife is very disappointed, you know, uh, in that, uh, but I'm telling you, you could tell that that was his was his father and that was his son. So I have little weird things that I've inherited as well. I'm, I'm a, a guy who has 10 measuring cups from my, uh, from my grandparents and from my wife's grandparents. And we still use these 10 measuring cups. I don't know why I like them, but I do, you know, they're just kind of cool. I, I like to have them and I, you know, I, my mother found out about it and she goes, well, do you want mine? I'm like, well, not now, you know, but someday, because she has a whole bunch of just beat up old tin measuring cups and they're just kind of cool, you know, and I like that. When I was in college, my, my father, um, I went to college and when I switched my, I was started out as a business major and, and then I, I, I started out as a business major and I also added theology and ended up with both of those degrees. But during that time, my father uh, gave me a Bible. And it was an inherited Bible that uh, he gave me. And it was a Bible about this thick, about this wide, you know, a little tiny uh, pocket Bible that uh, he had gotten issued to him when he was in the military. And it still has this rank and serial number and all that kind of stuff. And I just recently handed it down to my son, who, is a the who just graduated theology from, from Walla Walla. Different things that you uh, inherit. You know, two of our sons, well, our only two sons, got married this summer about a month apart. And, uh, and in the process of that, my wife was like, hey, I remember something. And so she's, she's, in, the, um, she's in, our, uh, in our closet, and we have this cedar chest, and she opens up the cedar chest. And in there are things that my grandmother, who knew she would not see her grandchildren get married, but she had handmade a number of things that, uh, 
you know, she had hand embroidery things and, and knitted some hot pads and, and different things like that. And it was just kind of cool to get that out and hand it off to our children when they got married this summer. Then there's things that you unexpectedly inherit, you know? You don't always uh, in- expect it. We always have those times when, um, you know, we, we think, man, do I have a rich uncle somewhere, you know, that, uh, you know, is going to give that? And, and I actually had that, we actually had that happen in my, in my wife's, my, my, my mom's family, in that uh, she got a letter in the mail one time. I remember as a kid, and she got this letter in the mail, and in this letter, it was like a check. And she's like, what is this? You know, totally unexpected. Because she had had a, a distant aunt who had passed away and had no living relatives of, of any kind. And so the state, and she had no will, and the state just divided everything up and uh, she got a small check. It wasn't enough to quit work, sadly, or anything like that. But uh, I remember she went out and bought a new couch with it, I believe, if that's what she got. So inheritances are interesting. You know, and, uh, you know, there's, there's things where we fight over inheritances, there's things where, Different things happen, but today we want to talk a little bit about some of the things we've inherited. We've inherited a different world after 9-11. I mean, our world is so changed and, uh, you know, not for the good in a lot of areas, you know, it's sad. Uh, it is more safe, I think, to, you know, they, they really check you out before you fly. I guess that's a good thing. But there's a lot of things that have really been changed. And, you know, we think about even our, our world av- after COVID or during COVID, I guess what we are. There's things that we've inherited from that. But I want to take a moment and let's look at an inheritance that took place after a long struggle. And we're going to take a look at that today. In Joshua chapter 14, if you'll turn your, turn your Bibles there, you see this story that you've all heard. But I want to take a look at it and just point out some things that I have learned as I've looked at Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, it says, These are the areas which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed as an inheritance to them. Their inheritance was by lot, as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses, for the nine tribes and the half tribe. All right, so here's what's happening. They have been in Jordan for five years. That's where they're at right now. They've been in Jordan for five years, and they talk about these nine tribes and the half a tribe. And you think, well, it wasn't there 12 tribes. Well, if you remember the story of the Israelites, when they came to the Jordan River, there were some of the tribes who says, hey, we like it on this side of the Jordan. We don't want to go over to that side of the Jordan. Can we stay over here, Moses? And Moses, you know, you talk to God about it, and he says, yeah, you can do that, but you have to come with us to fight the battles that are over here, and then when the battles are over, then you can go back. And, that's, and so that's where they're at. They're, they're kind of at this point where it's time to, to divide the inheritance, to divide the land up amongst the people for the tribes that are going to stay on that side of the Jordan. Now remember, this inheritance was a long time coming. It was not something that, you know, um, you pass away and boom, it all comes out right there. It was a long time coming. It was a lot of doubt and controversy. You know, Abraham had been promised this inheritance centuries before. You know, he had this, he had been told this land, this all you can see is going to be your families. And of course, Abraham does what a lot of us do in that when we're promised something and it doesn't happen right away, we try to figure out how to make it happen a little bit faster. And so he does when he says, I have no heir. And so, well, here, here's a way to get an heir. And so he got another heir and God says, no, that's not the one. You didn't do it the way I wanted you to do it. Have faith in me. And so finally we get Isaac comes along and we have this heir that comes along. And you know what? I think that sometimes in Christianity we have the same problem that Abraham does in that we try to help God when God says, I've got this. Have you ever heard the saying, I will do my best, and what does God do? God does the rest. Now, if you would show me that in the Bible, I'd be really appreciative. Because it's not there. It's just not there. You see, but that's the way we've lived our lives. You know, if I can do my very, very best, 
then God will just put on you the last 10% or the last 90% or the last 99%, but I've got a little bit to do in there. You know, we kind of, you know, to use a baseball analogy, it's like, you know, I'm going to hit a single, and God, you, you knock me in the rest of the way. You, you, you make me round the rest of the bases. Where sometimes we say, God, I'm really good. I, I made it all the way to third base. I just need you to, to get me the rest of the way home. You see, it's not in there. But Abraham, just like generations of people, have said, how can I do this? Because I'm not going to trust fully in what God has to say. And so he did it his way. And it really wasn't the way God wanted it to be. So now they've come down and they get out of Egypt. You know, they come down to this promised land. They've come up here and, and they got to the Jordan River. And by the way, if you've ever been to the Jordan, it's really not much of a river. It's not wide. I, you know, I remember as a kid thinking about, whoa, they crossed the Jordan River and the waters parted. You know, this was a massive in, in flood stage and everything. I've been to the Jordan River. It's a, you know, I can see why Naaman didn't want to get, you know, dunk his head in it because it's, it's just a dirty, muddy stream. I mean, yeah, it's a river, but it's not very wide. But they come to this, and they go, across there is where we're going to go. And he says, step into the, the priest, step into the water. The water parts. And in the, the Bible, it says, it says they piled up on one side and flowed down the other side. And I'm telling you, if I had been a kid, I'd have been going, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Because the water is piling up, just piling up over here. And it's just disappearing down there, and you're walking across on dry ground. I don't care if it's a wide river like the Mississippi or, or anything else. That would still be a pretty amazing thing, wouldn't it? Pretty amazing. But this is, they're headed to their inheritance. They get to the other side, and the first place they're told to go is go to Jericho. And once again, they're told, here's the way you're going to take Jericho. You're going to march around it, and then you're going to march around it, and then you're going to march around it again, and you're going to do this for seven days. On the seventh day, you get to march around it seven times. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine if you were Rahab and you're in the walls, and you have put your trust in these two spies that have come along? You put your trust in these spies. And you come along, and they say, Yeah, we're going to come and we're going to protect you. The first day they show up, they just march around. Wouldn't you have started to doubt a little bit these people that you've put your trust in? I mean, she's gathered her whole family. Like, if you all get together, we'll be able to stay together and we'll be saved. And they march around quietly, not saying a word. Next day, they march around quietly, not saying a word. Can you imagine her family is going to say, what kind of military strategy is this that's happening to these friends of yours? You see? But this is the way the inheritance came. The inheritance came in such a way that just didn't seem the way it would normally happen. Now the battles had been fought. The land had been surveyed. They made it through Jericho. They made it through all this other land. We get to Joshua chapter 14, and it says the land was to be divided up by lot. Now, it's not like what you see in TV where they all get together and they read the will. You know, we're going to sit down and read the will. You get such and such, you get such and such, and so and so gets such and such. No, it says we're going to divide it by lot. So I looked it up and I'm like, what does that mean? You know, the best way that most commentators will point it out is they said they had two, two bowls, two big old bowls. And in one bowl, they had like the district. So they would write down the district of, okay, you're going to get this district. And then in the other one, they had the tribe or the family of that tribe. And they would pull it out. They had just kind of a lottery system. Mix it all up, pull it out. Okay, you get this, and this goes to such and such a family. And then they would give it to that family, and that family could divide it up how they saw fit according to um, their, their tradition or, or to their family. That's what it says when they were dividing it up by lot. So it was basically a lottery system that you just kind of hoped that you would come out right, hope it would come out with a good piece of property. But then there's a twist. Because just as they're getting ready to do this, they're getting ready to divide this all up, this is where we have this twist that happened in our scripture reading. In this, in just verses right before our scripture reading. Verse 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb the son of Jephunneh and the, the Kinzianites said to him, You know the, the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses the servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed 
the Lord my God. The will is getting ready to be read, but Caleb says, excuse me, I want to step to the front of the line. I don't want to have to wait by lot. I'm not going to wait for this to be drawn out. I, I was promised something else. Now, it seems like, you know, it seems like it's kind of bold, you know? It's like, whoa, he's not willing to, to stand in line with everybody else. No, he says, God promised me this. You were there. I was there. Remember the whole story? Caleb and Joshua and the other ten spies, they went up into the land. Caleb was the guy who spoke first. You know, Joshua is the one that was the leader of Israel. But if you go back and study and read the story of the 12 spies, it was actually Caleb who spoke first and said, hey, we can go do this. It was Caleb and Joshua who had seen the giants. They had seen all of these things. They had seen these things that were terrifying. But they says, you know, that's where God's called us to go. We should go to our inheritance. This is the place we should go. That's what we want. Let's go. Numbers 13 and 14 tells the story of them almost being stoned because they wanted to go and do what God was calling them to do. Everyone else was talking about how these giants, these, these, these giants of the land, and Caleb is, is talking about facing the giants. And now 45 years later, he's standing before his friend and colleague, and he's reminding him about his own inheritance. God has kept me alive these 45 years, and yet I'm as strong as I was the day that Moses Sent, sent me. Just as my strength was now, so is my strength for war. Now, I don't know about you, but he's 85 years old. I'm not 85 years old, but I know I'm not what I was when I was 21. You know? And yet he's 85 years old and he's still spoiling for a fight. He's still ready to go. He's still saying, that's the place that God has promised me. Let me go get it. I just turned and I just visited my father who just turned 86. Because of COVID, I was unable to go visit him for quite some time. And uh, he had had some illnesses not related to COVID, but I was able to go see him. And I'm telling you, at 86, for a guy who used to be a maintenance director of an academy and loves to work in his shop, he hasn't been in his shop in a long time. He's slowing down. He barely walks around the block anymore. Those things are happening. And it's sad as a son to watch that. But I'm thinking to myself, Caleb at 85 was like raring to go, raring to see this inheritance that God had promised to him. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it say God told him he could have that land. And so I'm like, you know, where in the Bible does it say he could have that particular land? Did he just step to the front of the line and say, that's my land, uh, you should give it to me? Well, most commentators say that when the 12 spies went in that original time, when they went in that original time, they didn't all stick together and wander around the land together. It says more than likely they divided up two by two and went from place to place and came back and met at a pre-appointed a pre place before they went back across the Jordan. And so that's probably what happened is, is that he was promised wherever you had gone, your foot had gone, that that's where you're going to get. And so that's what he's saying. He's like, I already have seen those giants. I've already seen the mountains. I've already seen that. And you know, this is the mountainous area. He could have said, look, I know there's some really nice land here in Israel over by the Mediterranean Sea. I would like it on a cliff overlooking the ocean. He didn't ask for that, did he? He didn't ask for any of that. In fact, he says, give me those mountains up there that are going to be the hardest to take because i got to go up to the mountains and the giants are shooting stuff down at me or rolling rocks down and, and you know, all this kind of stuff at me. Now, I want to go, I want to take the high road. I want to take the hard road because that's where God has promised me to go. And then I think the best line is what was our scripture reading today where it says, but I wholly follow the Lord my God. Everybody else was saying, don't go there. This is dangerous. We can't do that. It's, they're too big for us. We can't do it. But it says, no, I wholly followed the Lord my God. And I looked it up in, in, in a little bit more in the original language. And in the original language, in, in Hebrew, it says, I fulfilled after. Well, that doesn't really translate well into English, you know? Like, I fulfilled after. 
So then if you look at the Greek that was, the Greek that was translated from Hebrew into Greek for the LXX, that was a translation, a Greek translation of the Old Testament. You look at that, and it says, I applied myself to follow. I like that. I applied myself to follow. And you read a little bit more about it, and you, as you read in it and you find out what was going on, it's really like when you're walking through snow, and you got a kid, and the kid can't really traipse through the snow very well. What does the kid do? He steps in your footsteps. And that's the idea of what Caleb is saying. He says, God was here, I was right behind. I was going exactly where God told me to go. I was following in God's footsteps. That's what he's saying. When he says, I wholly followed the Lord my God, I was not varying to the right or to the left. God said, that way, that's the way I went. And I was following right behind God. And then he says there in verse 12, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I will be able to drive them out, as the Lord has said. Give me my inheritance. God has promised it to me. I'm not afraid of those giants, because God will be with me. He's waited 45 years for this inheritance. He said, send me to the hills. Send me to the giants. Send me to the place that God has promised. I want to go. I'm ready. You read Joshua chapter 15, verse 13. You can see how it ended because he says he went there and he threw the giants out and he inhabited the land. His family took the land that had been promised to him. What giants do you have in your life? You have some giants in your life? Yeah? So do I. What things need to be conquered in your life? Do you have a few things like that as well? So do I. What inheritance have you been waiting on for a very long time? You see, we're centuries after Jesus promised to come again. We're still waiting on that one. But if that's all we're waiting on, it seems like we haven't really known what Christianity is all about. Because sometimes, sometimes we think, oh, I just want Jesus to come. No, I don't think it's that way. I think that's important. I want Jesus to come like anybody else. But is that really all we're looking forward to? Isn't God promising us to face the giants of our lives today? Isn't he asking us to take the land that he's promised to give us? He has so much more for us even today as we serve him. He has so much more for us in this life, not just sitting here patiently twiddling our thumbs hoping Jesus will come. Believe you me, there's enough signs in our times that I believe Jesus is coming very soon. That's not the point. There's enough things going on with all these kind of things going on in our world that we could have a whole list of that and a whole other sermon. But it really isn't about that right now. Right now it says, how does God want me to live my life in this community today? What, what, conquered, what things do I need to help conquer? Do I need to have God conquer in my life? That's the thing. Claiming the territory that God has given in our own lives. Claiming the territory that this church has been assigned to, hear, to reach the people of Paulsbo. This is the church that says, hey, we're going to be a light set right here on this hill. Every time I drive up here, I'm thinking, this is truly the church that's set on a hill. You know, not every church has that opportunity. You're on a nice little hill. People drive by here. What do they know about you? What do they know about you? This is the territory that God says conquer because there's people right across the street that need to know Jesus. And they're going to know Jesus not just by preaching. They're going to know Jesus by how we act and how we walk with them and how we talk to them. 
those are the hills that God has called us to conquer. I don't know what Pastor Greg has got for his, for his upcoming vision thing. I, I, I might just come and eat his pancakes just so I can hear what he's got in mind. Because it sounds exciting. And I hope all of you are there. Because together, prayerfully, you can reach the mountains and conquer the hills and conquer the giants that are in this land. And I've known about Paulsville for a lot of years now. And I've heard you talk about some of the challenges that you have here. But those are just giants that God has said, you can prayerfully say, I can go do that because God will be with you. So enjoy the pancakes when you get with Pastor Greg. But more than that, prayerfully, prayerfully say, God, send me to the hills. Send me to take the mountains and to take the giants that are in the land here in Paulsville. And that's my prayer for you today. Please stand with us as we sing our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision. you to be our vision. We want you to work in our lives individually as we face giants in this life, as we take the inheritance that you've promised because you've given it to us in this life. I pray for this Paulsville church as they vision together and look for the inheritance that you've promised here for this church, for the people of this community, that you would walk with them and bless them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.